Hi, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic, where today I want to do something a little bit different. Um, one of the privileges we get in running this channel is that we get a lot of very interesting uh, email correspondence and Twitter uh, conversation about Sudoku solving and the methods that people use. And a lot of people have different ideas about how to solve Sudoku efficiently. But one of the most interesting um, email conversations I've had ever since we've started the channel actually is from a guy called Kyle Corbin in North Carolina. And he's been studying a few of our recent videos and has observed that his technique, which is different from the technique that we typically use, seems to get some very interesting results. Now, in particular, there's two recent videos we've done. Um, Mark did one of them, uh, which he, it was a video entitled An Infinity War. You can see it on the screen there. In fact, at the very position that Kyle's method comes into play. And I'm just actually, I think it's instructive. It only takes uh, you know, less than a minute. But what we'll do is we'll look at what Mark needed to do to advance the progress of this puzzle at this point. So you can see he's made some pencil marks. He's used standard Snyder notation almost throughout. And by, by that I mean he's he's uh, in three by three boxes where a number can only go in one of two positions. He's notated that. The only two uh, divergences I've seen from that are in row five, you can see he's highlighted this 2-8 pair. And in row two, he's found a 2-8 pair. But that's all. So let's look at what Mark does next. And I'm thinking specifically that if we imagined that this cell was a five, that would fix this whole box because that would make this a nine and this one a two. That would push the two to here. Look at this. Look at this. Yes. Um, this would now be a nine because that was a five. That would make these two cells nine and eight up here. And that would mean that this cell is impossible. Why is it impossible? Well, because of that nine, we've now got nine, eight up here. So we've already got nine, eight, three, four, seven, six in the box. In the same column as this, cent this bottom cell, we've got five and one, and we've got a force two that we just worked out that five would give. So that is not a five there. So instead, that must be the nine. That gives us... Hmm. Did you get all that? Was that? Is that the way you solve Sudoku? Um, maybe it is. I mean, but that, that seems to me to be pretty complicated. And um, I think Kyle thought so too. So let's have a look at what he does differently. Um, no, not that one. Sorry. Uh, this one, I hope. Yeah. So this is the puzzle. And this is exactly the pencil mark notation that Mark had. Now, I want to talk very specifically about how, how Kyle's notation differs from what we normally recommend. So Snyder notation I've already discussed. Now what Kyle does in addition to Snyder notation, so Snyder notation is focused on three by three boxes. And notating in three by three boxes, and perhaps actually the bottom right example is the best one here, where a number can only go in two positions. Well, Carl extends that to both rows and columns as well. So he has a way of, um, I don't know whether he uses a different color to notate this, but what he's doing is if he finds that in a particular row or column, a number can only appear in exactly two positions, he highlights that. And that allows him to develop a method that he calls uh, pincers and pivots in order to make progress in certain examples. So let's look at how his method would work here. And first thing to note is that in column eight, there are only two positions where we can place an eight. So there's this one and this one. Can't be an eight down here because of the eight already appearing in row nine. Now, Mark's already highlighted in, in his solve, but if we look at uh, row five here, we have an eight in one of these two positions. So there are exactly two positions in row five and exactly two positions in column eight. And what Carl says is that allows him to view this three by three box here as a pivot. In the sense that because he knows that the eights are 
sort of locked into binary positions in two rows and columns, he can look at this square up here and he knows that this square here cannot contain an 8. Now why is that? It's because if there was an 8 here, he knows from the work he's done on column 8 that will force this 8 to be true. But if there's an 8 here, we also know from the work we've done on row 5 that this 8 will be true. So these pincers, as he calls them, this cell and this cell, he knows one of these must be true, because otherwise we'll end up with two 8s in the pivot box. And it's a very, very simple method, but really very elegant. And I was trying to think about whether or not this had a different name or, you know, whether this was a way of elaborating on another principle we might have worked on before, but I'm not so sure that there is a name for this. Um, do write in if you think there is. And I tested it. I went to one of the popular online um, Sudoku solvers. So here it is. And I, you can see I had to eliminate every single one of these weird techniques here before we ended up with something called a Nishio forcing chain. And the Nishio forcing chain um, does sort of, it's using, you can see it's using the same cells as Kyle's method to make a similar deduction, although it thinks, I think, that this cell can't be an 8 as a result of the way it thinks about it. Um, but it's it's far, I, I, even this, which seems to be using this, a similar type of logic, feels less elegant to me than what Kyle's achieved. And it certainly got me wondering whether or not in doing my own notation I should be trying to keep track somehow or better of numbers that can only appear exactly twice in rows and columns. I do try and do that but I tend to do it mentally rather than with physical notation. Now let's return, let's return to this puzzle now because Cal notes that there's actually another way of making progress. So he's already bashed down the door and, and got rid of uh, it's worked out what this cell needs to be. But then he finds another example. Um, now this time we need to think about nines. Now all I'm going to tell you is that for the moment. So do pause the video, take a stare at it, see if you can, given what I've told you about how Carl's method works, see if you can see where we can make progress using nines. And I'm going to talk about it now. Okay, so what Kyle notices is we can view this 3x3 three three box this time as a pivot because a 9 in row 7 can go in this position or this position, so exactly two positions here. Now, similarly, if we look now at column 8, can't be a 9 here, can be a 9 here, and there can be a 9 here. So again, in column 8 we have two positions for the 9, in row 7 we have two positions for the 9, and both of these sort of positions are ending in the same 3x3 three three block. So again, what we're able to do is we're able to say one of these pincers must actually be a 9. And that means this square here, which sees both pincers, cannot contain a 9. Now if we look at this cell and ask what it can be then, it can't be a 1, it can be a 2, it can't be a 3, it can't be a 4, uh, it can't be a 5, look we've got pencil, oh there's 5 there in fact, it can't be a 6, 7, 8, and we've just said it can't be a 9 because of Carl's method. So this cell also becomes a 2, and from there on, once you get that this cell is a 2 and this cell is the 2, the puzzle completely collapses and becomes trivial. It's really rather wonderful. And there's yet another example. So let's go back to this puzzle. Now this was a puzzle I did in my Sudoku Game Show edition of Cracking the Cryptic, where we looked at three different examples of some pretty dense positions on a Sudoku board and tried to work out what the next step was. And what I noticed about this particular arrangement is that you could use um, the sashimi finned x-wing to make progress. So just reminding you how that works, there are two positions for an 8, for example, in row 8. And you can see if we look up here at row 4, 
this can be an 8, and there's an 8 in one of these two positions. This square here would make the natural X-wing. It's already filled with a 2, so this is a sashimi X-wing with these two cells acting as fins. And what we can do here is we can say either it is true to say that this square and this square is an 8, or it must be true that one of these two squares is an 8, and that allows us to eliminate an 8 from this square. You can do exactly the same logic with the 5. Um, but have a look at this now, knowing what we know about Carl's method, and see if you can spot something you know, that, that works just as well. It works in exactly the same way, but I do think it's faster. It really is. If you get used to this method, this is really, really quick. So again, what Carl's doing is he's noticed if we look at the bottom left this time, looking along row eight, as we've already said, there are two positions for the eights, and two positions for the fives. Oops. Looking at column one, there are two positions for the eights and the fives. Both of these five and eight pairs are end up in the same pivot three by three box. Therefore, he's immediately able to say that either this is an 8 or this is an 8, and similarly for the 5s, and therefore he simply eliminates the 5 and the 8 from this square and immediately makes it a 1, and the whole puzzle falls apart. And he said this took him less than a minute. Well, I can tell you, when I stared at this position, it took me much more than a minute. So I, I really think there's something in this. Um, I'm not yet sure how I'm going to be able to adjust my... A pencil mark notation to deal with it but I'm certainly thinking about it and I'd really like to thank Carl for such an intelligent contribution uh, to the channel here and that's why I wanted to make this video so I hope that you enjoyed this logic as much as I enjoyed showing it to you if you enjoy the channel please subscribe we really appreciate it um, some of you may be in a position to sponsor us on Patreon too and we massively appreciate that and you even get our own puzzles uh, as a reward um, we'll be back soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.